Two one zero. Good afternoon, Sam and Emma. This is John from San Antonio. John from San Antonio. <laughs> How are you, John? What's on your mind? I'm good. I've been uh, enjoying your coverage of the COVID relief bill and the possibility of eliminating the filibuster. You've had on some excellent guests, including Adam Gentleson, Eric Levitz, and Alex Perrine. I appreciate the fact that you've mentioned uh, uh, if a bill is passed through reconciliation, it could trigger cuts to Medicare due to the uh, 2010 sequestration law. The fact that no real effort to eliminate the uh, or even reform the filibuster by the Senate leaders or Biden means that H1, uh, HR1, which originated in the House and is a voting reform bill that, that's being introduced in the Senate as S1, has no chance of passing. The same applies to statehood for Washington, D.C. and Puerto Rico. Activists are the only ones passing for the reform, uh, pushing for the reform of the filibuster. So it looks like a possible watered-down version of the, rev- of the relief bill will pass with uh, – Tens of millions getting less money from the government than they received uh, when they received the $600 in December under Trump. Uh, Biden has been wishy-washy about uh, helping people in a timely manner. While his rhetoric says uh, they want to help, uh, their actions show a lack of commitment, and the White House is afraid to, uh, to push the conservative, conservative Dems while he personally believes in some of their rhetoric. I wonder how many people will be angry uh, who, who received money in December but didn't receive any uh, money under Biden. And if the Democrats can deliver on the $15 uh, an hour minimum wage, and will it affect the midterm voters? Uh, here's a tweet from Ari Berman on Thursday. GOP voter suppression uh, plans roll back every aspect of mail voting, end automatic and electric day registration, pass onerous new voter ID laws, allow GOP legislatures to overturn the will of voters, Ger- gerrymander electoral college uh, results. In my last call to the show, I mentioned the five states uh, that had the, the closest uh, margins, with the exception of Nevada. Uh, had their electoral votes changed by voting by congressional district instead of winner take all, with the exception of Nebraska being uh, where they, they're going to change back to a, vo- a winner take all system, which means Biden, who won District Two, uh, you know, he would lose that that particular vote or any Democrat running. Uh, if those changes are put in place, I thought Biden would have a 272. Uh, electoral college win, but some states were leading, putting up their numbers by congressional districts, and Trump actually won three more districts in swing states, Michigan's 8th district, Pennsylvania's 8th district, and Wisconsin's 3rd district. So that means the electoral college would have been tied at 269 apiece, and the House would break a tie by having each state getting one vote, and unfortunately, Trump would win that vote by a 27 to 21 uh, margin, with Pennsylvania and Michigan being tied. Uh, an unfortunate effect of the 2020 election was that the return of the centrist voter. And if I, if I, progressive wants to run in a rural district, I understand that. But in most states, you don't have to live in a district you run in. So I'd recommend that progressive candidates run in, ur, uh, run in urban areas as opposed to running in swing districts. A good example of this is in Austin, Texas, where progressive Mike Siegel, who who two, ran two great campaigns in uh, 2018 and 20 but lived in a crack district uh, where he came up short. Uh, if he decides to run again, I would suggest that he runs against uh, Lloyd Doggett, whose 35th district runs from Austin to San Antonio. Uh, I don't know if you have any questions or comments. Uh, a what district did you say? A crack district? A crack district, you know, like a, a, a pack and crack. That's a... You know, that's what they do for gerrymandering. So okay. th- this is real common, like in okay. San Antonio. I see yeah, they, I see. they designate one Democratic district, which is like a Joaquin Castro's district, and then the rest of them, they they split the city up into to different um, uh, areas to where they have rural districts surrounding it, but the rural areas overwhelm the city areas. And so you end up getting resident representation from the rural areas and the suburbs that vote for Republicans. And that happens in Austin also. Now, I, I mean, you know, I think Doggett is is pretty good. He's certainly pretty good coming out of Texas. Uh, he would have been the guy who would have taken over Ways and Means if uh, Richie Neal had been knocked off. I mean, frankly, I would, I, I would, I, I, I would, 
I, I would uh, gather every single bit of resources I could to primary uh, Richie Neal. Uh, that would be um, uh, good. But, all right, so with that said, I just want to reiterate one point you made. Um, and this was uh, from the Daily Poster. People should check that out. That's uh, Sirota's thing. And uh, who, who, who's the other guy? I can't remember. Um, it, this piece was written by uh, Andrew uh, Perez. Oh, right. Andrew Perez. Okay. Um, and uh, he wrote a piece um, uh, citing Claudia Sam, who is an economist. Nearly 40 million Americans received the $600 COVID uh, payment. This is the point you were making, John. Yeah. In, in December. They would be denied checks, only see partial payments. In other words, you'd have 40 million people aggrieved <laughs> uh, who were like, I got screwed. As soon as Biden comes in, I get screwed. I get the full 600. And as soon as Biden comes in, I don't get the uh, the rest that everybody else gets. It's just, politically speaking, it's just the dumbest thing in the world. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, John, appreciate the breakdown, uh, rather depressing breakdown, of what would happen if those uh, so-called voting reforms happen with the Electoral College. Um, but let's hope that, A, they don't happen. B, um, Joe Biden plays this in a smarter fashion than, than catering to Mark Warner. Mark Warner is going to vote for the bill. Uh, and frankly, so won't Joe Manchin at the end of the day. Get them to vote for it. Let's, let's be serious. Let's stop uh, messing around here. John, I appreciate well, one thing they could One thing they could do would, would actually be to have the progressives say no. You know, like even in the House, say no. If you're not going to give uh, 70, if you're going to make the cutoff at 50,000, forget it. We're not going to vote for the bill, you know. Yeah. Well, yeah, I no, I tweeted that um, <laughs> because I think obviously you could get it could be very powerful if the Georgia lawmakers join with someone like Sanders and uh, and Ron Wyden, who's who's holding firm here. Um, yep. as he's chairs the Senate Finance Committee. Yep. Yeah. So the chair of the Senate Budget Committee, the chair of the Senate Finance Committee and the two uh, new senators who, who flipped the Senate for the Democrats saying, hell no. Yeah, that could be really powerful. Appreciate the call, John. All right. Thank you. Always a good call.